Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Koobana Volume 12, is now out. Collecting even more of your favourite stories from the show, you can find creepy ghosts, abandoned buildings, haunted shrines, fascinating monsters, and much, much more. You can find that on Amazon right now, and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at some terrifying tales of spirits from the other side that are here to ensure you don't have a good time. First up, a man notices that the apartment across from him has a strange smudge on the window that looks like a handprint. But that's just the start of something terrifying that may change his life forever. Find out why in Room 201. All names used in this story are aliases. The apartment building I lived in until last year was a U-shape. It was a three-story building with no elevator, and I lived in room 204. From the front door, I could see room 201 across from me. That apartment was empty when I moved in. I didn't want to dirty up my apartment, so I used to smoke outside on the doorstep late at night. Several people looked annoyed with me when they saw me smoking outside, so I tended to do it late at night. One day, I was outside having a cigarette around 1am when I saw something strange on the window across from me in room 201. At first, I thought it was just a white smudge, but as I got closer to look at it, it looked like a handprint about the size of a child's. Maybe one of the local kids tried to get into the apartment because it's empty, I thought. Oh my. I ran a finger over it, but I didn't feel the texture I was expecting. It seemed the stain was on the inside of the window. Ah, so maybe it wasn't one of the local kids, but a cleaner instead. I didn't think much more of it and returned to my apartment. Several days passed, and I'd forgotten all about the handprint. I went outside to smoke again one night, and as I glanced over at room 201, I noticed something strange. That handprint had gotten bigger. No, maybe that wasn't the best way to put it. It was kind of like, if you pressed down on it forcefully, and it was spreading out sideways from that. Like, moving out horizontally. That cleaner sure is something, I thought, and as I was looking at it, Tanaka-san from room 203 opened his door and stuck his face out. Ah, crap. Now he'd seen I was smoking. I quickly put the cigarette out in my portable ashtray, but I felt too embarrassed to turn around. (laughs) Ha 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 ha, oh, don't mind me, he said from behind me. Sorry. I turned around and Tanaka-san quietly approached me. Hey, it's getting bigger, don't you think? He said. Ah, you think so too? That cleaner sure is something, huh? Cleaner? Hmm, I wonder. What do you mean? I was wondering about it myself, so I asked the landlord when I saw him the other day. But he said that cleaning in this apartment finished long ago. Huh? So then, this is someone's idea of a prank? But the apartment is supposed to be locked. I asked him to take a look at it, but he just said it must have always been there and refused to listen. He is getting older, so his vision isn't quite what it used to be anymore. So then, what was it? The difficult look on my face must have made things a little weird because Tanaka-san then started moving towards the stairs. Ah, I've gone and said something strange at this late hour. Sorry. Well, I'm off to the convenience store, so... Every now and then, I sensed something a little strange coming from that room, so I decided to talk to an acquaintance, Satol-san, about it. He was one of those so-called spirit mediums you often hear about in threads here. He liked these sorts of things and read all sorts of books, as well as visited all sorts of suspicious locations. That was the type of guy he was. 
But still, he dressed normally and was a rather calm guy. I was embarrassed to make a fuss over something like this so suddenly, but I wanted to talk to someone about it. And if I had to talk to someone about it, then Satol-san would be the person to go to, I thought. After I told him about it, he wanted to look at the apartment right away, so that Sunday evening, I brought him back to my place. He was looking at the handprint so seriously that I was a little worried about what I might say if someone walked past and saw us standing there like that. Don't you think this looks like someone's trying to get out of this room? They want to get out? I'm just theorizing here, he said. Someone wanted to leave the room. So... The person who lived there beforehand did something so they were unable to leave? And then when they moved out, they still left something behind so that they couldn't freely move around? Yet they were able to show their presence at this window alone. Why did the previous tenant want to lock something in the apartment? Who the hell were they? Nothing made any sense. So, uh, do you want me to ask the landlord to go in there with us? I asked Sato-san, but he immediately refused. I'm not brave enough to go in there. There's something bad in the air here. Even an amateur like me can sense that much, he said, and then started walking downstairs. I hurried after him and then brought him dinner as thanks for coming to check it out. He knew a lot about these sorts of things, so... I listened to his stories until late into the night, and then went home. It was pretty late by the time I got back to the building, and as I was about to go upstairs, I ran into Tanaka-san by the letterboxes on the first floor. He was on his way home from work. Wow, that's rough. Working so late on a Sunday? I said. Yeah, I guess. We briefly chatted as we climbed the stairs. It was late, so everything around us was quiet. I couldn't bring myself to look at room 201. Tanaka-san was the same. We just looked straight ahead as we spoke about this and that. Well then. Yeah, see ya, we said as we reached our apartments. I took my key out of my pocket and was about to open the door, but for some reason what Satol-san said was weighing on my mind. I mean, it can't hurt to have a quick look, I thought, and I slowly turned around and saw Tanaka-san's profile. His eyes were open wide and frozen on one spot. He was, no doubt, looking at room 201. Nervously, I turned to look at it as well. Something was wrong. It's open. Huh? The window. It's open. I turned to look at the window, and it was indeed open. But that wasn't the only reason we couldn't stop looking at it. It looked like something was trying to get out. It wasn't in the shape of a person, like I thought it might be. It was small, black, and slimy. If I had to compare it to something, it kind of looked like a reptile and it was trying to crawl out of the open gap in the window. Crap. If that thing finds me, I'm in trouble. I just knew it. Panicking, I fumbled around in my pocket for my key. Tanaka-san was already trying to put his key into the lock. Mine was stuck in my pocket and wouldn't come out. I yanked it as hard as I could, but then the key fell through the railings and down to the ground below. To get downstairs, I'd have to take the stairs, and to take the stairs, I'd have to go towards room 201. I wasn't brave enough to do that. There was a sticky sound, and I turned around to see the thing had crawled out the window. There was nothing I could do, so I fell to the ground. Tanaka-san opened his door, and then, as he was about to go inside, that thing which had been moving slowly until now, sped up and slipped in through the gap of his open door. 
It was no doubt in Tanaka-san's blind spot. Then the door slammed shut and I heard footsteps running towards the rear of the apartment. After that, everything fell silent, and for a while, I was unable to move. I never saw Tanaka-san again after that. Now, that's not to say anything ever seemed strange in his apartment, or that I heard strange voices or anything. Nothing like that. It could have just been that we simply never happened to cross paths again after that. I let Sato-san know what happened after that because I didn't know what else to do. He said it was just a coincidence that Tanaka-san was chosen. Because he happened to be nearby. That was it. At any rate, I was just lucky. He didn't know what that thing might be either, but judging by its appearance, it wasn't something good. I have no idea what it plans to do with Tanaka-san. Will it do it right now, or will it take its time and do something in the future? Either way, I think it's best I keep my distance from him now, although the best thing to do would be to talk to the previous tenant. I did try asking the landlord for information, but he said he couldn't tell me anything due to privacy laws. And Sato-san refused to get any further involved as well. After all that, I took advantage of a work transfer and moved to a different apartment. This all happened several years ago, so I wonder if Tanaka-san still lives there, or even if that building itself is still there. I'm curious, but I'm also not brave enough to go back and check for myself. Next up, a young woman is friends with a girl who has strong psychic powers, and it turns out those powers may just save her life even after they haven't seen each other for a while. Find out why in Beautiful Psychic Girl Ichan. This is a story I actually experienced. It might not be that interesting or have a good ending, but here we go. About 10 years ago, I met a girl named Ichan who had a really strong sixth sense. And just how strong was that sixth sense? Well, ever since she was a child, she would always say things that seemed to predict the future. And once stories of this spread, people came from all over to ask her for help. Most people came to her to get help finding their missing children. Ichan just had to look at a photo and she could tell where that person was. And she was never wrong. But the catch was that this only worked if the person was already dead. Being just a child, she didn't think much about what she said. Like, she'd say things like, They're buried beneath concrete. It wasn't until she got older that she realised how cruel that must have sounded, and she stopped taking missing person requests altogether. And after that, she pretended that her abilities had disappeared entirely even though that wasn't the case at all. So anyway, I met Ichan when we were in junior high. My first impression of her was how beautiful she was. She was a quarter English, and she looked like a mix of Sasaki Nozomi and Kitagawa Keiko. She was so pretty that when we were in high school, I pushed her to enter the entertainment world, and she was immediately accepted by a large production company. She didn't really like it though, and quit after six months. Anyway, we led normal high school lives, and I often hung out with Ichan. We always went shopping and grabbed food together after school. One time, we were sitting outside some place eating some sweets when an old lady with a limp approached us. There are so many people today. Is there something going on? She said. The road below was full of people because of a festival. Now, I was pretty shy, so I usually let Ichan do all the talking in situations like this, but for some reason, she ignored the old woman and said nothing. Thus, I had no choice but to answer. I told her there was a festival going on, and then she nodded. Ah, so that's why there are so many people. She smiled and then continued down the stairs with her limp. 
Yi Chan remained silent the entire time. Finally, once I could no longer see the old woman, I turned to Yi Chan and asked her what was wrong. That woman died a long, long time ago. I was shocked. I mean, she was right there in front of me. I even spoke to her. You're kidding, I said with a slight smile. But Yi Chan was the picture of seriousness. If you think I'm lying, go check downstairs. She should have disappeared by now. Unsure, I went downstairs and I couldn't see the old woman anywhere. I even searched the first floor, but she was gone. The staircase was like a spiral, and the only way to use it was to enter from the first, fifth, or seventh floors. There was no way to get on the stairs between the first and the fifth floors, and we were sitting on the fifth. It was impossible for an old lady with a limp to get down in such a short time. When I returned to Ichan, she was eating Pocky and looked at me with an expression that said, See? It'll be fine. She probably just appeared because she was curious about all the people. She's harmless. So then, why didn't you talk to her? Once they know I have power, even harmless spirits will follow me around. But I spoke to her. You'll be fine, don't worry. It was the first time I'd ever seen a ghost. I thought they were supposed to be scary, more vindictive. So to be honest, I was kind of disappointed. She just appeared like it was the most natural thing in the world. It's kind of sad that even as a spirit, she still has a limp, huh? Nah, the ones I usually see have it much, much worse than that. I felt a little ashamed that I was still a little afraid after seeing such a kind-looking old lady ghost. And, once again, I was reminded of the peculiar world that Ichan lived in. I didn't see any ghosts again after that, and we successfully graduated from high school. Ichan got an office job, and I worked as a freelancer while living with my parents. As both of us were busy with work and part-time jobs, we didn't see each other very much. But we still kept in contact via phone and email. About a year after graduation, I heard that Ichan quit her job and was now working nights. The reason she started working nights was because her father was laid off, and her younger sister, who had gotten married young, had also returned to the family home. Ichan also had a handsome younger brother who looked like her, but for some reason he was a shut in who never left the house. Thus, Ichan was working hard to help support her family. It made me feel embarrassed to be working part time jobs while living off my parents like a parasite. I was looking for work, but it was hard to even get interviews. Eventually, I found work as a junior employee in sales. I was to work in a store where a murder had taken place several years prior. It was on the news quite a bit at the time. Now, I said I had a job in sales, but actually it was something a little different. I can't write down exactly what I did because if you look up the case today, it's pretty easy to identify. Anyway, once I started working there, I heard all sorts of stories about the place. Like the previous manager suddenly disappeared, or how all the employees suddenly fell ill one time. Stuff like that. I didn't really notice anything strange there though, so I didn't mind working there. At least until one year or so after I started the job. It was raining that morning, and there were few customers, so we were basically doing zero business. By the afternoon, Pretty much all customers had dried up. The manager and another employee were out on a delivery, so I was the only person in the store. Thanks to the rain, everything was kind of dim and creepy. I was killing time doing a little manual labour by the cash register, when suddenly I heard footsteps. I thought a customer had entered the store unnoticed, so I decided to scream, 
welcome at the top of my lungs, like the staff at Bukov do, so it could be heard throughout the entire store. I looked around to try to find the customer, but nobody was there. Maybe I just imagined it, I thought, and returned to the register. But once I started work again, again I heard footsteps. And again, there was nobody else in the store. After this happened several times, I won't lie, I was pretty scared. Again, footsteps. This time, I heard them clearly right behind me. At first they were soft, like someone walking, but now they'd turned into a run that was getting closer to me. Crap, crap, crap. I stiffened in fear, and then a familiar coloured jumper came into view. The manager was back from delivery. As I sighed in relief, the footsteps disappeared. Nervously, I turned around. Nobody was there. What's up? The manager looked at me with a confused look on his face. I tried my best to look calm and collected. It's nothing, I said, but no doubt my voice was trembling. The manager was demoted shortly after that due to some troubles, and more and more employees quit as well, so basically everyone who was working at the store changed. Suddenly, I was the person with the longest working history in the store. The new manager was fresh out of university and didn't even know left from right. And Kaykun, a part-timer, started work around the same time as this new manager. He had previously been unemployed and pretty much a shut-in at home, so he was a little weird. He wasn't exactly the best person to deal with customers, so his work mostly consisted of helping deliveries. Despite this, Kei Kun turned out to be a rather interesting person. He often spoke of anime and manga I didn't know about, and once he got to know everyone, he opened up more, got more cheerful, and was able to operate the cash register and deal with customers as well. One time, everyone was out on a delivery, and it was just Kei Kun and I in the store. He was in the office doing something or other, and because there were a lot of customers that day, I was busy at the register. It was getting difficult to deal with everyone by myself, so I decided to ask Kei Kun to help, and called for him outside the door once the customers had left. Kei Kun, could you come out here for a moment? There was no reply. The top third of the office door was frosted glass, so I could vaguely see inside. A figure in a staff jumper was moving around, so I knew he was in there. Maybe he didn't hear me, I thought, so I decided to open the door and talk to him directly. I rattled the doorknob. Kaykun had locked it from the inside. What on earth was he doing at a busy time like this? I was so angry that I started rattling the doorknob again and then yelled at him. Kaykun, what are you doing? Come and help me with the register. Then I heard a voice from behind me. Um, Emsan, what are you doing? It was Kaykun. Huh? But he was just in the office. He said that he was cleaning the back of the store. So then, who did I see in the office? And then I realised something. No matter how hard I tried to open the door, it wouldn't. But there was nobody inside. I definitely saw somebody in a staff jumper moving around in there. That was why I thought it was Kaykun. But he was in the back of the store the whole time. The office didn't have windows, so the only way in and out was through that door. So who did I see in the staff jumper inside? A chill ran down my spine. I was too busy dealing with customers after that, so I never figured out what happened. Kei Kun didn't seem to be lying about where he was, and the more I thought about it, the more scared I got. So I stopped thinking about it altogether. Several days later, I found flowers placed at the back entrance to the store. 
That incident that occurred years prior. Today was the anniversary. Every year on this day, the family members of the victim came to leave flowers. There was a small altar in the office as well, and every year, flowers were placed there too. Before long, those flowers would wither, but none of the staff ever got rid of them. It was like nobody wanted to touch them. I reached out for them, but then suddenly I heard a voice. Don't touch that! It was Keikun. He was always so calm, and it was the first time I'd ever heard him yell. Shocked, I quickly withdrew my hand. Did I do something he didn't like? I'd never seen him get angry like that before. Eh? Uh, sorry. Well, what's wrong? I apologized. But his response made me even more confused. Hmm? What are you talking about? You got angry at me just now. No, I didn't. I didn't say anything. He seemed to have forgotten that he yelled at me. Or maybe I just heard wrong. Just in case, I decided to leave the flowers there a while longer anyway. I continued work as normal at the store after that. I even started dating the manager, and was in pretty high spirits. After the rest of the staff left, we hung around in the store to close up and talk, and it was so much fun. One day, I was waiting alone in the store after closing time, but he still hadn't returned from a delivery. It wasn't the first time this had happened, and whenever I got scared being in the store alone, I'd just call a friend to chat until he returned. On this particular day, I decided to call Ichan, who I hadn't spoken to in a while. Hey, I'm alone at work and kinda bored. Wanna chat for a bit? She agreed and we chatted about the old days and such. But gradually, she started talking less and her tone got darker. Worried, I asked her what was wrong. M Chan, are you still at work now? I am. You need to get out of there right now. She sounded rather serious, so I told her I would. Luckily, the manager left the store keys with me, so I was quickly able to close up. I had no idea what was going on, but I told the manager that I had to go home first because something came up. Just as I was reaching for the phone to call Ichan and ask her what was wrong, she called me first. So what was all that about? I tried to ask, but Ichan interrupted me. Your workplace is dangerous. When you called me, there was so much white noise over the phone and your voice sounded weird too. You sounded like someone else entirely. She then said that if I continued working there, something bad would happen, so I should quit right away. I was confused. I should believe her. It was Ichan after all, but I couldn't just quit suddenly like that. It would make things harder for everyone else. And I lived in the countryside, so finding a new job so quickly would be hard too. After thinking it over for a while, I decided I would still go to work the next day. The next morning, as I stepped out of the house, Ichan was standing there. It was the first time I'd seen her in a while. But why was she here so early in the morning? As soon as she saw me, she got down on her hands and knees and begged me. Please, don't go to work today. She was crying. Looking back on it, that was the first time I'd ever seen her cry. I was surprised and kind of flustered. But in the end, she was so dead set about me not going to work that I gave in and agreed to take the day off. She then spent the rest of the day convincing me to quit, and finally, I agreed. She introduced me to a new job, and shortly after I'd finally gotten used to things there, I ran into someone from my old workplace. They had apparently quit as well. According to them, after I left, all sorts of things happened. 
Someone had a physical breakdown. Someone lost their mind. Someone was in an accident, etc., etc. Ichan didn't want me to suffer the same fate, which was why she had me quit. Several years have passed since then, and now I'm married to someone I met through a colleague. We've just moved into a new house together, and the other day, Ichan came to visit. When she met my husband, she was overjoyed. Everything will be fine now, Emchan. He'll keep you safe. By this point, I had already realized something. Why did Ichan, who was so pretty and popular with boys, always hang out with someone as plain as me? Why did Ichan, who was so smart, drop a level on purpose to go to the same high school as me? Why did she leave her modeling career after she just got it, even though she said she wanted to be a model? Whenever I said I wanted to go out alone, Ichan always said she'd join me. She had no interest in visual K groups, and yet she always went to concerts with me. She always accompanied me to the hairdresser or to go shopping as well, even when she had no interest in it herself. All of it was to protect me. Ever since we first met in junior high, Ichan noticed a presence lurking behind me. And because that presence summoned further bad things, she was always there to protect me. But according to her now, as long as I'm with my husband, everything will be okay. Her face looked radiant, as though a weight had finally been lifted from her shoulders. Ichan still works nights, but now she's studying exorcisms and such with a proper mentor so that she can help even more people in the future. She said that it's extremely difficult work, and when she purposefully tries to do things that she has, until now, done unconsciously, her power runs out of control. Because of that, she's seen things at home she doesn't want to see, and because so many spirits approach her, she's been physically broken down as well, even ending up in the hospital. But she still keeps trying. I don't think I'll ever be able to thank her enough for what she's done to me. I'm most grateful to the Kamisama for bringing her into my life. Finally, step into a creepy cave with a horrifying, deadly secret. Just be aware that you may never leave it again. Find out why in Limestone Cave. This happened a little while ago, maybe 15 or so years ago. There was a small limestone cave in my hometown. It was a rural area with nothing but rice fields and mountains, so the town tried to use the cave to attract tourists. This idea was abandoned, however, when it became too expensive to realize. Ah oh well, things like this can't be helped. That's grown-up business anyway, but after that, the cave, which was a little strange, was left abandoned. The cave was full of twisting paths, like most caves of this nature, but the most interesting part about it was an open space, about 10 metres or so from the entrance. It was about 25 metres square, and sunlight filtered in through a hole in the roof, shimmering on a pool of cold water below that sparkled blue like sapphire. The deep end of this pool was exactly one metre deep, so we used this area as a natural swimming pool and secret base. Of course, the grown-ups always told us in no uncertain terms that we weren't to go near the cave, but we were just kids and we didn't really understand why we shouldn't go in there. We never got sick of playing there and we always brought snacks we stole from home and treated it like our own private space. It was a hot summer day when we met him. The summer festival, the biggest event in town, was on, so instead of playing in the cave, we were running around the shrine grounds while the grown-ups were preparing everything. He was following one of the grown-ups and 
Then he sat down in the shade of a tree, looking bored. He watched us play tag for a while, and then, when I was it, he asked if he could join. Uh, I don't mind, but who are you? I asked. Something about him seemed a little weird, and he didn't look like a kid from the countryside. He laughed at my question and gave a short introduction. I'm XX. I don't have anything to do these summer holidays, so I came to see my grandparents. At first, we were a little wary of this stranger, but his stories about the city were pretty interesting, so we soon warmed up to him. That was why it didn't take us long to tell him about our secret base, and promise to show it to him. Five of us gathered that day. Me, my classmates A, B and C, and the boy. The boy's eyes lit up with excitement when he heard about the cave. I can't wait to see it, he said. As we passed through the narrow passage and arrived at the open space, he yelled excitedly. Wow, that's so cool! It's just like a video game! For some reason, we felt a little proud when he cheered like that. We told him that there was a pool a little further in, and he changed into his swimming shorts that he'd brought along and jumped right in. We quickly joined him and splashed each other with water. We were having so much fun that we entirely forgot about the time. After playing for a while, we got hungry, so we decided to go home and grab a few snacks, leaving C and the boy behind. All of us took about 20 minutes before we got back together again. I filled my water bottle with Kalpis, grabbed some snacks, and then met up with A and B. The three of us then returned to the cave together, but once we got there, C and the boy were gone. At first we thought maybe they were just hiding, trying to scare us, but we looked everywhere, even behind all the rocks, and there was no sign of them anywhere. Just as we were starting to get nervous, thinking that something had gone horribly wrong, I noticed bubbles forming in the water before us. A and B followed my gaze and silently watched the bubbles too. We stared at them for a moment until they finally got smaller and disappeared. What the hell was that? I thought as I looked at A and B. Then something round floated up in the same place the bubbles had just been, almost like half a soccer ball. We all froze, but then I realized it wasn't a soccer ball, but rather a child's head. And that long hair, there was no doubt about it. It was the city boy. Hey, are you okay? A screamed. C's not here. Do you know where he is? B asked. Look, just get out of the water, I said. We all tried talking to him, but he just kept floating in the water. Hey, stop ignoring us, A said angrily, and threw a small stone at his head floating in the water. Hey, stop! What the hell are you doing? B and I tried to stop him, but he threw another rock that landed in the water. Luckily, it didn't hit him on the head, but it landed nearby. That's dangerous, B said. What if you hit him? I said. A looked kind of upset that we were getting angry at him. Well, I mean, he muttered. I turned back to the water, but now the boy's head was gone. Hey, wait, I screamed. Then I heard what sounded like wet boots coming towards us from the narrow passage beyond the water, echoing off the walls. A and B were arguing, so it didn't look like they had heard anything yet, but I couldn't take my eyes off the dark passage in the rear of the cave, and I slowly started to back away. And at that point, A and B finally seemed to realise I was acting a little odd, and they turned in the direction of the sound almost hugging each other at the same time. The eerie sound continued, and it got louder as it got closer. I wanted to scream and run away, but I feared that would make matters worse. 
Next thing I knew, all three of us were by the water's edge, and that sloshing sound was even closer. B then slipped on a wet rock and fell onto his backside. That was enough to bring us back to our senses, and someone screamed, RUN! I started running in the opposite direction of the noise, back towards the exit of the cave. I ran as fast as I could, thinking of nothing but escape. Then, we were scared to death for the third time. A loud roar tore through the cave, like it was coming from the depths of the earth itself. I was cut off from retreat, but I couldn't even think of returning to where we came from either. I stood there, trembling, unable to do anything. We're done for, I thought. Instinctively, perhaps trying to escape from the fear I felt, I squeezed my eyes shut. Before long, I felt an impact, like somebody had thrown a rock at my head. A ghost hit me, I thought, stars flashing behind my eyes. Wait, ghosts can hit people? I was so scared that even my thoughts were weird, but then suddenly I heard C's voice. Hey! Are you okay? Huh? A, B, and I all said at the same time. Nervously, I looked up and C was looking down at me, worried. But B and C's fathers were also there and they were so angry they looked like demons. As we stared at them, dumbfounded, they continued yelling unabated. You little shits! C's father screamed. We told you not to come near here! C, were these three the only ones here playing with you? B's father asked. No, um, there was that boy from the city, C replied. Huh? Who? His father asked. Um, he said he was Nani Nani-san's grandson, I think. The two fathers looked at each other when C said that. But he was hospitalized a while ago. There's nobody at his house now. We were speechless. So then, who were we playing with? Look, we'll go and take a look, B's father said. You kids just go home for now. Before we even had time to ask any questions, we were all ushered home. I had no energy to do anything once I got back so I just laid down on the tatami mats by the air conditioner. My father came home after sunset. He burst into the room, a terrifying look on his face, and as soon as he saw me, he hit me. You idiot! he screamed. He never got worked up over anything, and the pain of the hit surprised me. I stared at him in shock and silence, and then he sighed and spoke more calmly. Look, since long, long ago, that place hasn't been somewhere anyone should go. Lots of people go missing, get injured, etc. When the town said they wanted to develop the area, we greatly opposed it, but they ignored us. And as expected, when they started construction, there were lots of accidents. I don't know who you were playing with there, but I don't want you to ever go near that place again. Please. Don't make me worry like that ever again. He was so earnest that I felt bad, and I promised I wouldn't go back there again. It seemed A, B, and C had the same chats, and none of us ever spoke about that cave again. As for the boy who disappeared, there really was nobody at the old man's house, so we just chalked it up to a collective hallucination. After I grew up and the statute of limitations had passed, I decided to ask around at a local bar about that cave. Some people said that it was a natural water prison, or that it was an air raid shelter during the war. There were all sorts of stories, but I had no idea if any of them were true or not. Either way, I have zero intention of ever going back there again. I don't ever want to hear that sloshing sound again, and 
I can't help but feel like that boy is still there waiting for us, even now. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Cummy Deer members, Christina and Estash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Koabana Volume 12, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Koabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Koabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.